there's any line that I push is that smaller and simpler is always better. I mean, it's just, as I, again, as I say in the book, a, a pretty good house should look like what a kindergartner would draw if you gave him a crayon and a piece of paper. Minus the chimney. Minus the chimney, exactly. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Pro Talk Podcast, a regular discussion with building industry professionals. This is Fine Home Building Contributing Editor and Production Manager at TDS Custom Construction, Ian Schwann. Today, my guest really needs no introduction. I've always wanted to say that. I'm joined by my good friend and colleague, Dan Kolber, Kolber Building, and also author of a book that if you follow Fine Home Building Podcasts, you may have heard of once or twice called the Pretty Good House Book. You can find the Fine Home Building Pro Talk Podcast and the original Fine Home Building Podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcasts. You can leave feedback and ask questions there too. Dan, it's great to see you and great to have you on my show for once. Nice to see you too, Ian. It's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a very long time of... Uh, very modern communication methods of right. soulless text right. messages back and forth. <laughs> so you, you've done a lot of interviews talking about the book and the, the pretty good house building techniques in general uh, and, and your work that you did with the other authors of the book. But today I want to make the assumption that most of the people listening to this are familiar with uh, the book in some form or another and just really dive into how contractors like you and and TDS and other contractors that we both have had in our orbit can start incorporating these methods and, and start making real differences in the way that they build. Deal. <laughs> so let, let's start from the ground up. Concrete is obviously low-hanging fruit. It's everywhere in our builds, tie in carbon. And increasingly in, in areas like Madison, Wisconsin, it's an increasingly short supply. So what what do we do to use less of it, Dan? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's scary, right, that we're going to, like, run out of sand in addition to everything yeah. else. Um, so the first thing is to build without it, right? I, I mean, you guys have had some great sessions with Mike Gerton talking about his talking about his growing up in a um, – you know, wood, wood foundation house, which is pretty cool. I've never, it terrifies me. I don't know, if been, <laughs> but, but clearly people have done it successfully. Yeah. Um, I've started jokingly suggesting that in uh, design meetings, like how about yeah. a you know, pressure treated wood foundation right. under this house. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so I, the one time I've really done it, I, we, I built a, a, a sort of a summer house, a guest house, um, probably about, I don't know, a thousand square feet, maybe 1200, uh, completely on helical piers. Uh, and it's fine. You know, you, you just, it's in a wind, it's in a pretty windy zone, blah, blah, blah. We had to, it was, it was something that was going to be in the flood zone in the next uh, FEMA map anyway. So we had to do flood preparedness. So we figured why not just get rid of the concrete? Um, you know, and we're, we're zone six, we're pretty cold zone. So it's not like, you know, we had to deal with figuring out how to keep the water from freezing both, uh, supply and, and, and drain. Uh, but it's worked fine. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think there's any limit to how big of a house you could potentially build on piers. There are obviously other issues that come along with it and people may not want to have their house built that way. Um, so, uh, you know, the whole slabless slab stuff that I'm sure has been talked about here. Um, just getting rid of your basement slab entirely and doing something else, uh, that gets rid of at least a fair amount of concrete that, that's not necessarily doing anything other than providing a floor. Um, and then otherwise, uh, you know, just don't over engineer it, I think is the best thing. You know, don't ask your, ask the engineer, you know, people are still specking 10 inch walls, which seems kind of crazy to me. Um, I don't know. Was it somebody? Was it Mike? Somebody was talking about doing something with a six inch wall. Uh, which again would scare me, but if the engineer says that's fine, why not? Um, but you have to push back on on those assumptions, right? Because I, I think right. there's a there's an idea that over engineering, using more material. You know, you guys talk in the book about back in the day, you used more wood, more concrete. Right, that meant exactly. you were doing a better job. So, but having done these things yourself on projects, did it do anything to change your workflow or increase your costs? No, it definitely did not increase costs. If anything, it was cheaper. I mean, the beauty of helical piers is 
you know, your entire excavation cycle takes two hours and there's zero site disturbance. Uh, you know, you, I mean, you still need to excavate for your water, you know, for utilities and that kind of stuff. But, but, you know, it's incredible. The guys show up with their little, you know, trailer driver thing. Uh, it's very light. So it's not even particularly messing up the site. And they come in, they set however many pairs you need, and they're gone. And then you start, fra- you know, you start framing that second. As soon as they're, you know, as soon as they start up the truck, you can start framing. And I've so seen no, you I, do some, you've done some pretty interesting stuff where you've had houses that were sinking that you you used uh, helical piers to bolt onto the side of them. Uh, where yeah. I think a, a lot of people would have just started digging and, and more concrete, more steel, uh that kind of approach. that was fun yeah that was um yeah we did a story yeah we did a story that's i think fine home building or i can't even remember what magazine that was in i think fine home building anyway that was a fun project i mean that didn't save any money i priced it out both ways but um but again it just was much less site disturbance we would have had to get we would have had to get inside the house to do it with concrete too we would have had to and it was a semi-finished basement um anyway this so this the story with this was we were adding a a second floor to a ranch and um, the engineer had said, you know, when you get into it, you're going to have to check and see what the footings look like. And we dug and we found there were no footings. Um, <laughs> so we had to do something, which is not that uncommon for around here, but any, and obviously that, I mean, not obviously the house had been fine up till now. There were no cracks or anything, but, but clearly we couldn't add load without doing some remedial work. So anyway, they came in, they drove a bunch of piers and then they, welded on these uh, brackets and bolted it all together and they were done. Do you find that it's easier to convince clients or architects to go with something like a helical pier that's an engineered method as opposed to, you know, we're not going to do a basement slab. We're just going to do a couple of alternating uh, direction layers of plywood and glue it and screw it together and you're going to be fine. Well, I have to confess, I have not done a slabless slab yet, um, I, partly because, uh, well, we actually haven't done a ton of new construction lately, um, but partly because we, the new houses that we have done, they, they wanted polished concrete as their finished floor. Um, so we haven't done it. There may be a job that we will be doing it on. I mean, I don't think anybody has like this huge attachment to the notion of a, of a concrete slab that I've seen. I mean, the architects that I work with certainly are all into it. Some of them have already done it on other projects. What about I think helical piers actually may be more of a stretch. I think that that may be a little scarier. Hmm. Well, it's just kind of terrifying, right, to get rid of it entirely. The first time you do it, it's kind of scary. (laughs) Sure. Yeah, you're just running this uh, steel rod with a couple of uh, look like the end of a drill bit on it or the end of a screw, and that. That's right. what you're putting your structure on, right? Right. And we've done a bunch of additions, and that seems a little less intimidating um, than, what, than a whole what about, house. Uh, what about shallow uh, frost-protected foundations? Have you done any of those? Are they taking root? And- I have not done them, but they're big in Maine. I mean, Geologic has been doing them for, you know, 10, 15 years now. Um, I haven't done them, no. But, they, but I certainly think they're a good solution. I mean... The thing that makes me nervous about that is is the foam, and we all know how much insects love that foam. And so I do have concerns about longevity. Um, you know, when I do foam, I'm typically – well, we're putting it wherever. But, you know, it, it that's the only – that's the part of it that makes me nervous. Is I, it would be great. I'd love to dig one up 20 or 30 years later and see what the foam looks like. Right. Um, the foam is such an integral part of what makes the system work, right? So right. if you end up oh, with yeah, a lot of everything. insect damage or other right. – and a ground living rodent damage right. to it, what does that do to your – the longevity right. of your build? Right. But the prospect of building – I mean, in that case, you could potentially build the whole house with zero concrete. I mean, that would be pretty amazing. Or, or very little at that point. Right. You, you yeah. only need your concrete stem walls and a, and a footing. Right. right. That, you know, you and s- there are other things. Too. I mean, there are obviously precast concrete piers. There's port-in-place concrete piers. There's, there's grade beams. You know, there's all sorts of ways to get around having to do the standard, you know, eight-foot tall. I mean, we're not right. building a lot of basements anymore anyway, frankly, in new construction. Um, but even with that, even with a four-foot, which is what our frost depth is here, 
you know, even that's a lot of concrete. So, right, and it ends up being a lot of carbon too, right? It's the oh, a huge. The right. I mean, that's the big. That's yeah, that's the big issue. It's just it's, you know, there are some promising developments out there with with um, you know different formulations getting rid of the Portland cement. You know, obviously using. Uh, you know, using d- different admixtures and using different formulations. There are ways to reduce it, but but it's just a very carbon intensive thing. Yeah, I would be concerned about getting those different mixtures in an area like where I live in Wisconsin, where I, I spoke to a concrete supplier last week, and you know, his words to me were, "Yeah, we can get you a couple of loads between now and Memorial Day, but forget it after that." So yeah, that shows how full full out some of those plants are running. I, I'd be yeah. surprised if you could even get them to dye concrete for you, let right. alone run a, a special mix that's got less right. Portland in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's right. Yeah. True. So from too. the from from the carbon perspective, how you know cutting the concrete in half is that to you? Is that a good start? Is that maybe a good gateway into uh, a, a longer term getting away from concrete, the, the using less of it? Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think it's worth it to evaluate everything, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's just everything we do really needs to, we, everything we do needs to have a, a very fast payoff, um, you know, we just, we've run at, we, we, we're, we're out of time, right? We've long since been out of time. Um, and everything we do now that adds to our sort of, you know, car, total car, total historic carbon load is just making the problem worse. So I really think we need to, you know, we need to, whatever we need to live. We're obviously hugely, uh, we've got a huge housing deficit in this country, um, so we need to be building, but, but we just need, you know, so we are going to take a carbon hit. I mean, there's just no, they're not, there are no great ways to do it without doing some carbon, but we just need to really, uh, whatever treasure treat, treat carbon as like a, you know, sacred resource or something. Sure. Well, what do you say to a builder who would say to us right now? Well, you know, I, I do two, three houses a year, what what kind of difference is it going to make if I cut my concrete use in half? Yeah, well, I mean, to a certain extent, he's right. You know, it's, it's. I mean, our, you know, what we do is, is trivial compared to the commercial developer or compared to, you know, whatever the rate at which China is building housing or whatever. It, it's true, but, uh, you know, you got to do what's, you got to do what's within your power, Right. You can't have much impact on how anybody else builds. And also, you know, we need to change. We need to change how people think about this within the industry and and outside of the industry. And the only way to do it is to get started. You know, if he if this builder, he or she builds X way, then maybe that person can convince people he sees at the lumberyard to do it similarly. Yeah. From my perspective, it it the easiest way to do it comes down to can you do it uh, less expensive and with the labor you already employ instead of right. having to go out and uh, spend valuable time trying to source different people to do different parts of the project. If you're a company like yours or the one I work at where you typically employ carpenters, you know what can you do with that labor that you've already got? and reduce your material costs on top of it. To me, that that's the gateway for, for getting through to the, the small builder. Whether or not you could do that to somebody who builds 50,000 houses, I'm, I'm not sure if that makes right. sense to them. Right. And jumping ahead to the, you know, to framing, I, you know, that's part of the reason why I've always been such an advocate for double stud construction as opposed to, you know, exterior foam or whatever is because, it is basic carpentry. Nobody, nobody who's anybody who's ever framed a house knows everything they need to know to do a double stud. Yeah, and thinking back to when I started to think about building my own house, and I was in in Maine for a trip, and I visited one that uh, you and Ben Bogey were building in. I think it was in Falmouth, uh, Maine, and I got to see the double studs as they were getting filled in, and uh, Ben did a lot to talk me through how simple it can be to 
to build one of these houses without gilding the lily, so to speak, with a bunch of unnecessary materials and unnecessary lumber. Uh, Is is there a a good, better, best type of uh, wood product that you like to use? Uh, You know, there's regular stud lumber everybody's familiar with, but there's tons of composite and uh, man-made materials out there now. Um, You know, I typically try to use regular dimensional lumber as much as I can. Um, I think when you get into, you know, when you get into complicated structural needs, then you got to think about it. Um, uh, You know, I certainly use LVL over steel. I try to avoid steel as much as possible. Um, I haven't looked into very deeply the carbon load of of LVL or I-joists or whatever, but... um, I don't know. Have you covered the beam calculator? Yeah, you guys have talked about the beam calculator, right? Yeah, it's we've such talked a great about resource, it. Yeah. And it's a great way to, it's a great way to compare your various, when you're starting out a big project, it's a great way to compare various strategies. But as in your terms, the, the sawn lumber is still the, the most economical. And then by using the beam calculator, it can be considered carbon storing, right? Yeah, I mean, wood is a you know, wood and carbon storing is a complicated subject. It's, it's and I and I don't even know. I don't even know if we know enough yet. You know, um, Jacob, one of the developers of it, is always talking about forestry and soil science and all that stuff. And and I don't know. You know, clearly, healthy soil is 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 we're learning more and more is a key part of the carbon store. So if you're just buying two by fours that came from a plantation, it's probably not particularly carbon storing. Right. But you make a good point about valuing something like a, like an LVL over a a big steel beam that has a, has a much more uh, industrial manufacturing process than, than wood members. Have you done anything with the, where you've had to use laminated studs or LSLs for projects that had tall walls? Um, you know, we certainly use LSL for the, for B, for posts, for point loads. Um, I haven't done a whole wall of them. Um, but, you know, there are. I mean, there, there are some interesting ways. There are some interesting products out there that are trying to use wood in interesting ways. The question always is, is the manufacturing process – carbon intensive enough that that it's outweighing the benefits of using less wood in the first place right uh that kind of goes into sheathing as well it, it's hard to know how some of the sheathing products are made and we we're just right. sort of coming out of a time period where some of them completely disappeared from local markets in certain right. areas too uh, do you have a, a go-to sheathing system that you like to use for your builds, particularly the additions? Um, no, not particularly. I mean, you know, I like—I mean, I like working with CDX just because it's tried and true, and and you know, there's a whole issue of um, vapor permeability with plywood versus OSB. That that you know, plywood like like un like unprocessed wood its vapor permeability increases as it gets wet. Um, whereas OSB, because there's so much glue and resin in it, it doesn't right. do that. So that's a nice feature. Um, but no, I, frankly, I don't particularly have a favorite system. I mean, it's not, um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Huber. I think they make great products. So I certainly use Zip system, all, you know, plenty of the time. Um, I think, you know, I, I just give Huber a lot of credit. I think that there are a few things that have been as transformational as Zip System in terms of it. it even, even by, even without knowing it, you're building a pretty airtight assembly just by using their product. Right. Yeah. You're, you're almost building one by accident. Exactly. At that point. By right. Using I mean, you still got to learn directly. about the weak spots, but yeah. Yeah, it does go go much further than having uh, have your two. Uh, lowest people on the totem pole go around and wrap the thing in Tyvek or something right, like that. Exactly. Right, exactly. Right. I mean, I guess the only thing I can say is that I, you know, we're still at, you know, we're still a heating climate. We're doing cooling in a way that we never used to, um, but obviously we're still predominantly a heating climate. So I try to just increase vapor permeability as I head to the exterior. Um, and that's really been my strategy for a while. 
Um, in fact, you know, more and more, I'm in wondering in my climate zone, if we should just be as vapor open as possible in both directions. It's one of those, you know, as I, as I always joke, uh, developing an interest in building science is a good way to never sleep well again. <laughs> and this is one of those, this is my current obsession is, is vapor drive. Right. Yeah. Which, which way do you, do you want it to go? Do you want to control it? Do you want to just let it run wild? But right. we'll, we'll get into cellulose insulation later. And I think there's a lot to be said about how your insulation system fits into that. But on the, the wood topic, do you see a difference uh, when you use a, a wood siding product and up in Maine, you're still probably using a lot of very local woods for siding, whereas where I am, it's much more uh, in the LP uh, smart side composite wood uh, type of range. But uh, I'm also a big fan of going the extra mile on the rain screen and being able to help some of that uh, wall assembly uh, vapor drive and then the longevity of the siding too. Yeah, I, 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 I like LP a lot too. And I think that the fact that it's got you know, a really bomb proof factory coating is pretty fantastic. So I wouldn't, you know, we use it frequently. I mean, you're right. Maine has a ton of, uh, wood products. We've got a lot of, you know, there's a ton of Eastern white cedar siding that either is coming from Maine or from Quebec. Um, you know, there's, there's hemlock. I mean, we've got everything, obviously a lot of Eastern white pine. So we do have access to a lot of local stuff that other people don't. And a lot of these materials that we're talking about in the the wood portion of a, a build are really easy to get. You know, if you're in an area that is at all populated, you're you're going to have a series of lumber yards or big box stores that can provide you nearly all of these options. And yeah. from your perspective, the the wood siding's got to be a better idea than boral fly ash type of uh siding oh, yeah, yeah, or yeah. I mean, or definitely. any of the uh cement board products right yeah i mean i stopped using fiber cement a long time ago um i mean basically as soon as i discovered lp was out there um i i really anyway and yeah and boral i mean yes at this point i really try to keep products like that for for stuff where i'm worried you know where it's either at grade or close to grade and i'm worried about rot I think that's one of my biggest takeaways from not just the Pretty Good House book, but from getting to know you and other members and Nessie in general is it's not so much we need to eliminate using a product that's the, that we need to use it thoughtfully and use it in the correct right. place, right? Right. Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, right. Imagine, yeah. We need to, I mean, I'm not a particular, I'm not, I'm not a religious person, but I keep thinking about like, if we just like decided that these things were sacred, right? That like petroleum was like a sacred product and we used it, you know, for really important things rather than for. For everything. Just for everything. Use it, exactly. use it worth, use, use it things with reckless abandon. Yeah. Right. Uh, in Maine, you guys also have a, a burgeoning industry of wood fiber insulation uh, have you gotten a chance to get a hold of any of the the early product being put out by that? I plant? mean, I've got samples from the, from you talking about Timber <laughs> HP, and uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, they're like putting Maine on the map. It's funny; it's amazing how much press they're getting. If their product fails, we're, they're going to like make Maine <laughs> secede from the country. I think <laughs> they're going to become um, part of Quebec at that point. Exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, I've seen samples. Some of my crew has gone on the tour of the mill up in Madison. Um, supposedly they're coming out with some stuff soon. Supposedly they're rolling out the loose fill. I mean, the, um, the bats. you know, the, the, no, the, uh, you know, the, the, the cellulose replacement product, right. the blown in, um, that's supposedly coming out first, then bats, but even the board stock is supposed to be out. Like I'm looking at a project with Mike Maines and he is assuming that we'll have access to the board stock by the time we need it. Um, so, yeah, I'm very excited. I mean, I think everybody's excited. I think the big issue is going to be that everybody's so excited that it's going to be hard to get for a while. Right, so like the European product is. Right. And there is, and there is a Canadian product, too. I think – I can't remember if it's out of Ontario or Quebec. But there is, an, there is a Canadian product you can get as well. Have you used much of the wood fiber board that's coming in from Germany on any of your projects? No, I have not used it at all. I mean, partly because we, 
I haven't done any renos where we're doing outsolation. And if we're doing new again, I'll, I just even 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 once Timber HP comes out with the board stock, I'm still going to go with double stud over any kind of out outboard insulation. Right. Yeah. You you and I share uh, an anti outsolation point of point of view for many reasons. Mine mostly yeah. that you know how how do you flash anything? When yeah. You're going to that that extent and doing windows in the middle or you know in my right. opinion god forbid the inside of the wall right. <laughs> uh you know how do how do you keep that assembly sound over the the long haul uh the wood fiber board that i've used i think was the gutex product uh from germany when i worked for hvp with the uh, mason and uh it seemed like the ideal use of it was when we were working on very old homes from the late 1700s and you were trying to protect the interior finishes and it it seemed like a really good way to take a timber frame structure and and give it some r value and some some hope for the future uh, but still i i think it ends up being a, a flashing and labor nightmare but um, i'm interested in the bats and especially the loose fill as we you know, start to think about cellulose insulation and whether or not we're going to have a shortage of, of right. that material even being available to the right. uh, uh, to the manufacturers, right? Yeah, it would be crazy if they were if they made paper just to shut it up into cellulose, <laughs> right? But on uh, getting to the insulation topic, uh, aside from using as little spray foam as possible, which I think most eco conscious builders have that on their radar and and have switched to cellulose in in any uh option where they can uh talk us through a little bit of you know what in your mind makes cellulose such a great product especially when you're uh with the double stud walls right um you know it's well from a carbon perspective it obviously blows most of the other traces out of the water it's potentially carbon storing um Meaning that you're, you know, that, that you are, that the, that the use of it, that you're fixing carbon within the cellulose in quantities greater than it took to get there. Um, you know, one of the things I've learned from the beam folks is, is that agricultural waste is sort of the end all be all of this stuff, right? That straw bale really is fantastic because it takes all the carbon from this agricultural waste product that would just sit there and either burn and release this carbon that way or decompose and burn, lose this carbon that way. And you're just fixing it in place for the lifetime of the product. Um, but anyway, cellulose is, is certainly, uh, a, a second. I don't know how close it is, but it's certainly in terms of available and, and standard construction methods. I think it's the best option out there. Um, are, the other are thing, there any... you know, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to ask, are there any other, you know, places where you're using cellulose regularly, like in attics? Obviously, it's been a, oh, yeah. a go-to product for that for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I try to use it everywhere above grade. Yeah, I mean, we do renos, we do it with renos, you know, we do it everywhere if we've got access to the walls. And again, thinking about your, your regular contractor doing projects, are are there any issues with getting cellulose i know sometimes it can be difficult to find someone to dense pack and not everybody's as crazy as me and is going to try and do it themselves with some some hack rented equipment and be okay with with a moderate success but uh, do, do you see any issues with somebody who maybe fiberglass bats has been the way that they go switching over to cellulose as a product Right. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we're lucky in Maine that we've got some really world-class uh, cellulose installers, but I know that that's not true. I mean, I don't even know if it's true at all outside of New England. It seems like it's very much a regional thing. Most other parts of the country, it seems like if they're doing blown in, it's blown in cellul uh, fiberglass. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely an issue. And I don't, you know, I don't have any clever advice other than to keep pushing for it. I mean, I don't, it doesn't... It's definitely a skill, right? I mean, that's the that's the scary part about dense pack is that if you do it wrong, it's it's really it's bad news. I mean, I guess that's true for any insulation, but well, it's true for any building, right? Right. You know, if yeah. Any uh, any of the things that we do, if you 
some of them have a wider margin of error, but yeah, cellulose right. not not so much if you're going to dense pack it and try and get right. the benefits out of it, right? Yeah, right. And if you do a mediocre job in your, I mean, whatever. Yeah, if you're if you're stopping a fair amount of the heat flow, but not all of it, and you're not stopping the airflow, you know that you're in trouble. So anyway, I, I don't know what to tell people in other parts of the country. I mean, maybe timber HP, maybe that model will be successful enough and easy enough uh, that it that it helps that situation in other parts of the country. I don't know that you need the same density. I, I've heard varying reports on if you need the same density with, with the wood fiber insulation. So talk about some of the, the things that you gain from cellulose when you do dense pack it. Uh, you talked about the vapor openness of walls and the drying potential, your wall assemblies. Where does cellulose fit in that? Uh, it's great. I mean, it's got it's got a couple of qualities that are often get talked about. Um, one is that it it does since you know people think it's dangerous that it absorbs moisture that somehow it's going to like draw magically draw moisture to it. But the, you know, but it's not this the same amount of moisture going through another product. You know, it's not it's it's going to be the same amount of moisture no matter what the product is. If you're putting something that does not absorb moisture, it's going to go directly through it and onto whatever the next surface that will absorb moisture, which is probably either your framing or your sheathing, um, where it'll cause more problems. So anyway, cellulose will absorb the ambient moisture and distribute it a, a bit amongst, you know, sort of just disperse it to the rest of the cellulose, and then it'll dry as conditions allow. I mean, there's a limit to how much it's going to absorb, and you can certainly get into trouble, but under normal circumstances, you know, if you got it, if it's a really humid point, um, you know, it'll absorb that. And then whichever direction it can dry to as conditions allow it to dry, it will. Um, and it'll save the structure. Um, you know, it's, I mean, it's got, there are definitely rated assemblies, right? It's got a fire rating if it's got some mm -hmm. additives. Um, I, you know, it's just got, I, I think it's a terrific material. I think it's easier to retrofit than a lot of other materials, certainly in spray foam. It's reversible. It's easily reversible. Um, you know, it's definitely dangerous for the installer because it's really dusty, but it's nothing like, you know, working with spray foam or, or fiberless insulation all day. Right. Yeah. It's a, every one of the insulation products out there kind of has its, its own, uh, hurdle you've got to jump over as the right. installer, you know, whether it's you know, respirator for cellulose or respirator for uh, spray foam and a Tyvek suit or a Tyvek right. suit for fiberglass. It's it's a not fun thing to install. Uh, do you ever use any of the foam board products, XPS, EPS, or or even yeah, mineral sure. wool? Yeah, we use it. Um, you know, obviously below grade, you don't have much choice. Um, I, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a mineral wool skeptic, frankly. I, I think, I mean, I think it's a great product. I, I just think that it being sold as an environmental alternative may be kind of oversold. I think it takes a huge amount of energy to produce. So I you don't think know. it takes Again, a lot of energy to liquefy rock and then yeah, aerate funny. it and spin <laughs> it that. into a board. Right. right. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm going to get beat up by the Rockwell folks, but um, that doesn't sound energy intensive at all. No, exactly. <laughs> so I actually, I mean, if it's a if it's a job where we just need to throw some bats in, I mean, frankly, these days I'm reaching for fiberglass. Um, I mean, Rockwell, you know, the mineral wool has many good qualities. I think it's a great, it's great for sound attenuation. It's great where more, you know, if moisture is a concern, it's great. But anyway, I, you know, so I, if we had to use it below grade, I would not have a problem with that. Um, you know, we tend, obviously we try to find the lowest impact stuff, which these days seems to be either EPS or, or even the GPS, the graphite, you know, the GPS stuff, the, the darker material. Um, you know, it's all about the blowing agents. I mean, supposedly all these products have gotten a lot better or we we're dealing with, you know, carbon equivalencies in the single digits as opposed to the tens of thousands like they were not very long ago. How much uh, impact do you think green building has had in getting especially XPS and the manufacturers of it to kind of get off the, uh, the high GWP blowing agents for their products? Um, I have no idea. I mean, I, frankly, I'm, I, I doubt it's had a major impact. 
I think presumably regulations. Um, I, I just doubt that there's been enough of a market demand for lower GWP products. Uh, you know, most of the industry seems to be perfectly happy to use whatever. Um, so I'm a little, I mean, as much as I'd like to cre- take credit for it, I, 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 <laughs> I doubt that that's been the issue. I mean, I think, you know, again, I mean, whatever, we can start getting into the political stuff now if you want, but uh, you know, <laughs> this is not a, this is not a solution we're going to buy our way out of. I mean, we right. need, you know, the government, you know, state power is pretty much the only thing that's a, that's a counterweight to corporate power. And, and we need to, you know, we need to say this is killing the planet quickly. And, and I think in this case, that is what happened. One of the, the comments that I had made to many people in uh, the Nessie group that I was in with you for a short time was, you know, the products already on the shelf at the big box store. Like what is us discontinuing its use going to do, but I've kind of come around to the thinking of, well, if you approach it from a purely capitalist standpoint, if people stop buying something, the maker right. of it is going to go, why, why is our, you know, why are our sales of the pink and blue board down 15% right. in, in Maine or a, a given area? And uh, I, I come to the thinking that maybe that's, that's the idea behind it. Uh, but you could certainly be right. And obviously like with the beam, you know, with the beam and other people, you know, who are demanding environmental um, product declarations from all these manufacturers, I think that has an impact. Um, if only, if one person asks them for it, it's one thing, but if suddenly they get, you know, a dozen or a hundred requests for EPDs, I think that that starts to get them thinking that they need to, that they need to focus on that. Do you use spray foam at all? And if so, where, where do you, yeah. uh, where do you use it? You know, it? we'll use spray foam. I mean, you know, we try to get the, 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 I'm blanking on the name, but you know, the lower impact blowing agent. Um, where have I used it recently? Uh, we had one funky framing situation where the only way we were going to meet code, you know, we just couldn't thicken up the assembly enough. So the only way we were going to meet code was spray foam. Uh, you know, it was a, it was a relatively trivial, was, you know, maybe a hundred square feet out of a, you know, 2000 square foot project. Um, and, you know, if we're doing renovation, we'll certainly do it below grade, like in an old, you know, crumbly stone foundation. It's, kind of the only option um so yeah i'm not i'm not opposed to doing it but again i think you know you need to think about you need to think about time scale i guess right we don't we uh, throwing carbon into the environment is is really a bad idea right now and if the payoff for any of this shit is more than you know two five years whatever you want to say it's it's just not you know, the payoff needs to be really fast or it's a net negative. Yeah. Again, from the, the capitalist perspective, one, it's costly over other insulation options. And two, it's a specialist that has to do it. Right. So that, right. those are, those are two good points for me as a builder to put out there to other people of, you know, if you can avoid it and do it with the labor that you have or with uh, non-specialized labor, there's there's at the very least cost savings that should be looked right. into if if you're not uh, motivated by carbon or or green right. building techniques in general. Yeah, and I think it's also important to remember that you know air sealing always trumps R value, and uh, you know it's great to get an R twenty on the wall, but I mean if you can air if you can just air seal really well, you're going to get most of the benefit for probably a fraction of the cost. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you've come out in favor of window restorations, especially in the older <laughs> yeah, stock of homes. Uh, what what, yeah, what about to... in other parts of the country where they don't have uh, uh, gorgeous handmade? Oh yeah, wood sure. Windows, I mean, if you're you know? replacing a, you know, if you're rec- replacing a crappy builder's, you know, production window from 1970, I don't think you should feel any great pain over it. <laughs> yes, this is a very specific issue, which is that you know you're working on a house that's whatever, 100, 200 years old, and the windows are a prominent part of it. And, you know, this is one of those issues, right? You can't um, act like 
you know, we're saving the planet by renovating houses is obviously nonsense. <laughs> so if this house has, has an inherent beauty or historical quality, like, so you just don't do it. Uh, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, we got to stop pretending that like, it's sort of missing the forest for the trees, right? Yeah. I, I just had to throw that in there because you, you've been attacked. Uh, I know. Well, Rachel, I felt bad for Rachel. Like, she had to like slap on the brakes and, Yes. Anyway, I'm glad I can be at the center of controversy. That's right. That's I, I would like to see the uh, the building industry in general make some of these points, you know, much less controversial and and much more. You know, if you're a, a builder in Maine, what works for you? I'm in Wisconsin. Right. What works for me? Hey, there's somebody in Texas. What works for them? Exactly. Uh, and you know, start to think through building in in those terms rather than uh, not saying that uh, you can be accused of this, but acting like you're better than everybody else because you use, you know, cool, fancy products. Right. No, my self-loathing is almost as big as my other loathing. <laughs> I, I um, think if you're, if you're world famous for anything, it is your self-loathing. There you go. <laughs> um, I would say, yes, I completely agree. And for me, you know, one of the exciting things that has come out of COVID is just this explosion of the BS and beer stuff. And the number of local chapters is fantastic. You know, when we started our building science discussion group 100 years ago, the whole point of it was, you know, we're dealing with, you know, Maine has this very old housing stock. Um, and we were, there were a bunch of us dealing with it. And it's like, well, why are we like, doing this in isolation. We're all learning the same lesson, but separately, why aren't we talking to each other? And so we did. And it was very much like, okay, Southern Maine, here's what we're dealing with. What do we do about it? Um, it was never meant, I mean, certainly plenty of the principles are universal. The physics, the basic physics doesn't change no matter where you are on the planet. But, you know, obviously there's a lot of different there's there's different on the ground situation. There's different meteorolog meteorological issues, all that stuff. So anyway, I'm just always thrilled when I see local people getting together and talking about this stuff. Yeah, and the the one constant you touched on it before is air sealing, and that's really a make or break part of the build, right? You do it well, and it can cover up all the sins of construction, and do it poorly, and even the smallest oversights right. are going to come back to to beat you up and there's a lot of materials right. out there and some of them rely heavily on plastics. So what are, what are your go-to tapes and membranes for getting these high performance assemblies to work? Right. Well, speaking of local conditions, you know, we've got, um, performance building supply here in Portland. Steve is the, was the host of the building science discussion group, in fact, and he's probably the biggest SEGA dealer in the U S. Um, so because it's easy and because Steve is a friend of mine and because I like their products, I tend to use a lot of their stuff. Um, but, you know, I, I think that now that zip tape is an acrylic, you know, when it was butyl, I was a little more concerned about it. Um, but now that it's acrylic, I, I, you know, we, I mean, I use all this stuff. I mean, I don't, I don't get too bent out of shape about what it is I'm using. It's more important to get it right than it right. is to maybe use the perfect material uh, here yeah. or there. Right. And I think that, you know, for the, for, for very specific situations, you know, there are specific products, like they're all, you know, Proclima and Sega, they're both making really cool stuff for windows for like the interior air seal in the windows. Yep. You know, there are products that adhere to concrete for taping off maybe your bottom course of sheathing. You know, we're very lucky to have access to these incredible products. Yeah. If there's any two, tapes that if I could get more people uh, to even know they exist or use them, it would be the, the tape that you use at the bottom of the wall where you seal that sheathing to the concrete foundation. And then that the, uh, the pre-folded tape that you use to air seal the interior of a window. I know a lot of people are, are doing uh, what Travis does with backer rod and, and stretch caulk products. And I think that's great, but uh, if, if you're going to get your labor force used to the mechanism of taping things by virtue of using zip or some other WRB, I think that's a, that's a, a great product to be using on your builds. Yeah, we've, I, I, we've pretty much given up doing anything but tape the inside. I mean, I don't, I don't even bother insulating the, the RO. I, I just think 
how much R value are you going to get in there? I think that was one of the things Ben convinced me of when he was with me was to just tape it and forget about it. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I got from Ben was on the other side of that. But if you really, really can't sleep at night, if you don't put anything in there, do mineral wool or something that's actually going to drain, uh, right. drain and work with the water. Oh yeah. I got pretty obsessive before I gave up spray foam. I was doing actually doing back a rod against the, you know, exterior of the window, the window flange before I shot spray foam in because I thought, well, at least this will give it a little bit of a drainage plane. Right. But that, that also shows the, the importance of resilient, uh, assemblies right. that I think oftentimes gets, gets overlooked is you, you have to think about these assemblies in terms of, they are going to get wet at some right. point. They are going to take on water vapor at some point. So what do, right. what do they do with it? And uh, most of the air sealing products that we all use have some degree of uh, vapor openness to them, right? Are there, are there anything that any materials that you've seen other people put on the exteriors of their buildings that you're just like, whoa, what are, that's defeating the purpose, like – Ice and water comes to mind for me as right. one thing that yeah, should for be sure. on the wall. Right. And I mean, that's part of the reason why I don't like, ex you know, why I really, that's another reason why I don't like exterior foam, especially in a cold climate. Um, I just don't like the idea of an impermeable layer on the outside of the building. Um, but other than that, yeah, I mean, I think, right. I mean, seeing people, I mean, I think not seeing a rain screen makes me a little anxious these days. Um you know, I, I mean, I don't tape the bottom flange of windows. I think probably a lot of people are not doing that these days. I don't know, you know, I don't know. I don't have any, like, I haven't seen any research, but it just always made sense that, um, you know, the windows on the exterior, it's a, it's got a lot of potentially cold surfaces, it's got a lot of good places for moisture to condense. So it just seemed to make sense to give that a place to go, which just makes air sealing that much more important on the interior if right. you're going to have it not air sealed by design on the exterior. A lot of the stuff we've talked about today is all parts of the project that your typical builder in this country can have direct input or, or even in, in your case, demand total control over <laughs> to where, where do you advise a builder who wants to you know, take up some of the things that you've written about in the pretty good house book or talked about on, many of your podcast appearances where where does that builder start we had a we had a session in our building science discussion group years ago we were talking about like well how do you keep how do you keep the sort of the energy details out of the negotiation um how do you hang on to them when the budget starts getting chopped and one of the things we talked about was just say like the shell is not negotiable right like you don't even you don't even need to know what the shell is right the, the client doesn't even need to know what the shell is we're gonna we do it, it it needs to work as a system we've got a system you know you don't have any input in it it doesn't get touched uh you know i mean you got to come up with a slightly nicer way to say it than that, but <laughs> but the basic idea being that like you know, this is stuff that's critically important to the house, critically important to your comfort. Um, and you don't get a second. I mean, you might get a second. If you get a second chance at it in your in your lifetime, it means you screwed up. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, it's just something that has to be done right. Um, and so you just don't make it don't make a negotiate. So I think that the, the first thing is just to have a system. Right? The first thing is to look at the project. And it doesn't it probably shouldn't be the same system for every project, obviously. But look at the project, decide what makes sense. I think the design community is at least as anxious as the build community to be working on this stuff. So hopefully you've got an ally on the other side of the drawing table um, and just figure it out and present it to the client. You can explain why. And then, you know, it's just sort of not a negotiating tactic. How much of the the build methods that we have in this country, do you think just come from us being creatures of habit? We, we find something we like doing, we can teach it to our employees, we can buy the material for it locally, and we just stop thinking about it. Yeah, I think that's true. I also think in new construction, it's that we don't have any 
you know, most builders don't have any connection to the house they built once they're done. Right. I mean, neither do the developers for that matter, right? I, I sort of feel like there should be a law that like a developer has to own a building for 20 years. Um, <laughs> so they have to deal with all the crap that they did poorly the first time, right? Um, yeah, that could backfire. But, you know, they could do it even more poorly because they'll find out that maintaining it and redoing it later is right. cheaper. That's true too. Um, but I, I, I think that, um, yeah, I, I think that, yeah, I think there's a lot of reasons. I mean, I think cheap oil is probably as big a driver as anything, right? That, that, that the fact that we could heat our houses cheaply meant both that there wasn't any econ, there wasn't any economic reason to build it better. And also that the houses survived poorly, you know, drafty houses survived because we were blasting heat through them every winter. Yeah, and low interest rates and cheap money right. making it easy for people to live in a home for five years, flip it to the next person, move right, on exactly. to something you know, bigger yeah. and better hasn't has not right. helped. It's it's helped a lot of builders make very good livings and become right. wealthy, but it it hasn't done anything for the the quality of the builds. Right. It certainly hasn't helped the planet out much. Right. I mean, there's a graph early in the book that that talks that shows um, you know two crisscrossing lines and. The uphill line is is square footage of home of the average home, and the the down line is the number of people, uh, you know, the average size of a family, and uh, you know, so it's just this explosion. I mean, if there's anything that I, you know, if there's any line that I push is that smaller, smaller and simpler, is always better. I mean, it's just, you know, it, I mean, it means, uh, you know, it's a, sometimes it's a drag for me, right? I mean, if I you know, I like doing funky framing as much as anybody. And, you know, we like doing interesting corners and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I mean, I think, as I, again, as I say in the book, a, a pretty good house should look like what a kindergartner would draw if you gave them a crayon and a piece of paper. Minus the chimney. Minus the chimney, exactly. <laughs> well, Dan, despite your best efforts to make it the contrary, it's been a pleasure talking to you and, and having you on the show. <laughs> Uh, is, is there anything else you want to throw at the audience or any uh, manifesto you want to read on the way out? Oh, God. I mean, my current <laughs> obsession is, uh, is are we unwittingly parroting uh, propaganda from the petroleum industry um, about, you know, carbon footprint and uh, sort of everybody taking individual responsibility for their own piece of this? So I think that we need, uh, you know, I think that like things like your podcast – any of these efforts, I think collective action is our only hope. So I would encourage everybody out there to find a community, whether it's your building science, you know, your local BS and beer, even take over your NAHB chapter. I mean, anything you can do with other people is always going to have a much bigger impact than stuff you do by yourself. I love it. I'm getting you over onto the people hill from the planet hill. <laughs> I love it. Well, Dan, thanks for taking the time to join me today. And thanks to everybody for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. Please like, comment, or review us wherever you're listening. It helps other people find the podcast. Thanks again, everybody. <laughs>